Welcome to UFC Connected. Under the guidance of head coach Eugene Barrowman, Auckland's City Kickboxing produced not one, but two UFC world champions in 2019. Now considered to be one of the top gyms in the world, we travelled to New Zealand to discover the secrets to their success in battlegrounds. The native people of this land were very proud people. And they have a history of being warriors and defending what's theirs. It's in our blood to fight. My ancestors were doing it on the battlefield, fighting for land. It's just in me to do this. Everyone is tough, and that's why we've bred such good fighters. We all help each other build towards that world stage. The honest truth is my initial goals were to teach a bunch of people cardio kickboxing at night and during the day me and my business partner train for our own fights. <laughs> As the years got by uh, I got more and more fighters and it became a bigger and bigger part of my life and fighting became a lesser part. More and more fighters started to turn up, they liked the way we were doing things and then the fight team got bigger and bigger and bigger and better and better and better. Ah and then it just escalated into what it is today. Representing City Kickboxing in New Zealand, training under Eugene Behrman. I mean, this City Kickboxing, these guys are on a roll. Big knee and Jim Miller is out! Dan Hooker! Oh, Right now. This gym is really important to New Zealand, to the country, because of what we're doing for the culture of fighting and just for the culture of sports in New Zealand. We're not like rugby or cricket or yachting or any of these other rich sports with government backing. Like all this was Eugene from the ground up. This is the main part of the gym, so this is where the bulk of the training gets done. The facility is exactly what we want. It's 100% workspace. There's no room for any fancy big screen TVs or fancy cardio. It's an environment and it's a facility that is solely set up to make people the best version of themselves that they can. She goes to push me back into half guard. I just blast her. <laughs> a gym really is just four walls. What people fail to realise nowadays is it's not about the facility. The facility could be a shed. It's the people that count. <laughs> the perception is that it's an individual sport. You couldn't be further from the truth. It's very much a team sport. Acting in a way that supports and uplifts other people, I believe that's the way forward. There's no egos involved, and, and I believe that's all part of the overall environment and all part of the overall success. You have to humble yourself when you come to work. You can't just think you're the man 24-7 because it doesn't work around here because you're not the man 24-7. You were late? No. You sure? So you were late. Having all these teammates fighting consistently, they always come back and give their time to the next person. So, you know, you have your fight, you do your camp, but then after, you come back and you give your body to the next person that's competing. You're back in the gym and you're helping the guys around you to train for their fights, and so it's that culture of helping each other. We'll go to bat for each other. The first time Eugene holding pads for me was a different experience. I remember just feeling free. People think, oh, you have to go to America, you have to go to Canada, you have to go to Thailand to train. We're like, nah, we have what we need right here. Yeah, they can't f with us. What we have done is put our head down here and our up and just worked really hard. And as a result, we've gotten to the place where we're at now. It just made it possible for everyone else to look at it and be like, yo, this is real. 
It's a real UFC belt that one of our own brought home. Once I see something done, I'm like, oh, it can be done, and I can go in there and do it. So now I see these guys with two titles, you know, it just, it just drives me even more. And no! I'm hungrier than ever because I feel like I can taste a world title. Seeing what, what they can achieve and how it's right in front of me, it's definitely inspiring me. We did a little bit of baby! Every UFC fighter that I have, our goal is to make them champion. And that's what we're striving towards. If you come here on a Monday night or a Saturday morning, the days we spar, you'll see so many killers that you won't even heard of. Everyone challenges everyone. If I walk on the mats, it's going to be a tough day, no matter who I'm with. You will, without a doubt, see another UFC champion coming out of this gym within the next five years. The future looks bright. With so much talent in the ever-expanding UFC roster and events taking place around the globe, the next breakout star could come from anywhere. Luckily, we have our very own Nostradamus in the form of analyst Dan Hardy to give us his unique insight on who are the ones to watch in 2020. As a UFC analyst, I'm constantly watching new fighters that are being added to the cards that I'm commentating on. And I'm always looking for exciting talent that's coming out of different regions. I'm Dan Hardy, and these are my top five ones to watch in 2020. At number five, Da Eun Jung. Da Eun Jung, for me, is one of those fighters we definitely have to keep an eye on. 12 and two, two wins in the UFC. His first fight was absolute chaos for as long as it lasted. It was wild. Tell you what, Darren Jung, look at him, not phased at all. He stayed calm, he was able to find his way into the fight in the later rounds and got that beautiful guillotine. The arm under the chin. Yeah, yeah, the tap. Tap. Wow! Wow! Darren Jung! And then his most recent fight was even more impressive. Oh. 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 Is down. Wow. And that's it. He speaks well, he's a very personable fighter, but at the same time, he's very, very exciting. And in the light heavyweight division, I think he could really stand out this year. At number four, Cyril Bongaman Gan. Cyril Gan's introduction to the UFC with the legalization approaching of mixed martial arts in France, timing couldn't be better for him. Making his debut, we all expected this very, very seasoned kickboxer to just dismantle his opponent. Reversing the takedown and getting an arm triangle finish was a real surprise. There's the top. Welcome wow. to the UFC, Cyril Khan. He showed beautiful kickboxing in his second fight. Light on his toes, seamless in his transitions as well from his ranges, long range to short range striking. Oh. But again, I ended up on the floor right at the end of the fight. He drops back for a heel hook. And I even made a joke about it in commentary. Like, oh, he's dropping back for a heel hook. Like, like surely this is not going to happen. And he nails it. He's looking for the hill hook. Wow! Zero <laughs> submission number two. Wow! How about that? 2020 is really the year for Cyril Gann. 6 0 undefeated with the legalization of mixed martial arts. This guy's going to be headlining the fight in Paris without a doubt. At number three, Jack the Tank Shaw. Sitting octagon side last year in Copenhagen for Jack Shaw's debut. I was anxious, but I was excited at the same time. Still undefeated, a very mature fighter for 24 years of age. I knew he was going to be a good addition to the UFC. He is without a doubt one of the hottest prospects that we've ever had coming out of Europe. Sometimes fighters get to the UFC a couple of fights too early, and I feel like Jack Shaw's timing was perfect. Jack just handled it like a pro. That's time, that's it. The win over Hernandez was really Jack's opportunity to show the UFC fans what he's capable of. His fights are very much the same in the approach that he takes. He's devastating in his approach, but it's clinical at the same time. He breaks his opponent down with good striking and finds his opportunity to take them to the floor. Big squeeze, and there's a submission! Wow. He's got all the potential to start climbing himself up the rankings, and by the end of 2020, he could be looking at a number by his name. At number two, Super Sadiq Youssef. Sadiq Youssef is yet another one of these Dana White Contender Series fighters that's stepping into the octagon with great success. In Sadiq Youssef's UFC debut in Adelaide, I knew he had punching power. 
but his head movement and his timing, his ability to find his way into range to be able to land that punching power is really what set him aside. Oh, these are big shots coming from him. Oh, it's coming up, and that's it! Oh. Super Sadiq gets it done in one! What we aren't seeing at the top of the tree at the moment are those power punches, those devastating finishes that can switch you off with one shot. That's what we've got with Sadiq Youssef. If he can land that one shot, it's game over. Oh! Super Sadiq has arrived! At number one, Edmund Golden Boy Shabazian. Edmund Shabazian is a very young, exciting fighter that's got a wide range in skill set. His win over Antonio Jones on the second season of the Contender Series is the type of thing that Dana White's looking for. Just swam over him. That quickly. The thing that stuck out to me is his maturity, his patience in the pocket, shot selection, good timing, looking for his targets and being very effective with it. Oh! oh. And big oh. Big oh. Big oh. Big oh. In New York at UFC 244, the way that he was able to manage distance, he took his time, that swift one-two that immediately dropped Tavares, and then his ability to not rush in, maintain patience, pick his shots. Oh! Head kick knockout by Edmund Shabazian! I'm really excited for Edmund's progress in 2020, especially in this middleweight division, someone that can step in and get those fast finishes like that. I think 2020 could be his year. Having grown up in the Democratic Republic of Congo before moving to England aged 12, Mark Chikese has overcome many challenges, both inside and outside the octagon. We travel to the north of England to meet the UFC lightweight and hear his story in Fighter Focus. When I first moved to England, that's the house I lived in. I moved to England when I was 12 years old. When I arrived, I didn't speak the language. I didn't know anybody. My family was in Africa, so it was like starting over again. This is where we played most of the time, you know, just me and, me and my brother. Usually we should kick balls and probably smash some of these windows. Yeah, How are you? Yeah. Good to see you. <laughs> I didn't really know much about MMA when I went to MMA gym. It was just a cocky kid come in, like uh, I think he was up to a bit of mischief and stuff, and uh, got sent to the gym to like sort himself out. Well, this way it all went down. I felt like I was welcomed, and I kept going back, kept going back, and uh, here we are. Obviously, life is a lot better now, you know. I've got a good job, I can provide for my family, and I'm just grateful to be here chasing my dream. When I signed to the UFC, first three fights went great. It is all over! Mark DeCasey! There is a man that loves his job down. Oh. Oh, that is a huge shot to the midsection. He just shot through the roof as a prospect. And then he hit a bit of bad time in his career. People always said my wrestling wasn't good. So I felt like if I go to America, I'll learn wrestling. But things didn't go as planned. I was away for like six months each time, and I was leaving my family. And it wasn't fun. I'm there training, but it wasn't fun. I was losing fights. I was going through a breakup. I felt depressed. I lived there for two years. When I came back, I had to really sit down and think what I want to do in my career. Jonathan Fire was like, make or break. Mark, the bone crusher, Jacasey, back in Doncaster for this camp, was previously at ATT. The Europeans were just drilled into your head over and over. You got to go to America, you got to work on your wrestling. He worried so much about going over there and doing what he thought he was supposed to do that I think he lost himself. I was going in to prove to myself what I'm capable of. Mark Jacasey has lost three fights now, so really didn't even expect to get another shot inside the octagon. Already, you see some redness on the calf here of Joe Duffy from the calf kicks that Jacasey's already landed. Oh, nice low calf kick there by Jacasey. I was like, if I want to break my leg tonight in this fight, I will break in this fight. I did not care. Oh, lead elbow from Mark Jacasey. Right now, 
out. Jacasey is slowly just starting to pick him apart. Lovely work there by Mark Jacasey. For the winner, by unanimous decision, Mark Jacasey! Yeah, I felt it. Tell me what you're going through, my friend. That's all we want to know. It feels good. I just want to say, everyone, believe me. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's it. <laughs> Nothing else. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for the Funk Crusher, Mark Jack Casey. Still feel it. I felt I was back on track, but then I knew it was like a lot of work to do. This is the second chance I've been given to take my career in the right path. <laughs> It made sense for me to be in Leeds and to really focus on my training. A lot of martial artists, there's always going to be an up and down. You learn a lot about yourself during that. You grow as a person. I feel like Mark has grown. Maybe a couple of losses might have been the best thing that's ever happened to him because he's come back to the drawing board. Sometimes he come at me at 3 o'clock, he'll have turned three times in morning. I say, you're a madman. But that's what he's like. He's living the life and it's like it's taking over him, which you need to be if you want to compete at top level. This is his daddy daycare and, uh, <laughs> yeah. But they're loving it, look, so. <laughs> my kids, man, my kids, I love them. <laughs> it's a nice feeling as well when you're providing for your kid, you know? It's the best feeling in the world. My son is called Bone Crusher Jr. at school. And he comes at home as well, play me in the game. <laughs> That's my daddy. He's quite good. He beats me. <laughs> I believe you or not, he beats me. Yeah, he's pretty good. I just take each day as it comes, realizing what I'm capable of, realizing my potential. Where I'm coming from, there's not many people can make it to this level where I have, and I've realized that. Here we go. All right. All right. So, so... I've got a lot of family members still in Africa, you know. I'm working hard one day, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, to help out a couple of people. But for now, you know, I'm just taking each day as it comes and just be grateful for everything that I have. Former WEC champion and now coach at the world famous American top team gym in Florida, Mike Brown knows exactly what it takes to be successful in the sport of MMA. Responsible for the rise of some of the most prominent athletes in the UFC, we sat him down to find out what it's like to be an MMA coach at the very highest level. I'm grateful that I'm in the position I am where, where I do what I love. I, I didn't I think that was always a possibility. I grew up in a very blue-collar family. Sometimes I didn't want to go to school, and I would tell my parents, like, oh, I don't want to go to school. My mom would say, well, you think I want to go to work? Life sucks. Get used to it. I go to work every day, and I don't want to go. I'm like, oh, damn, you know, she's right. But sometimes you get lucky, and you get a chance to do what you love. ATT, I've been there for a long time. I've done everything at that gym. Worked at the front desk to a fighter world champion to now one of the, the main coaches. They're my family and it's a huge part of my life and I wouldn't have it any other way. See you later. You can be a great coach without ever fighting before in the past. I'm ready. But I do think it definitely helps. It's a feeling for the techniques. It's an understanding of the pain and the suffering and the highs and the lows. Come up. Hey, get a hand in there. No, get a hand in there. Oh, that's tight. You see the toughest people you've ever met brought to tears, crying their eyes out. The sport can be devastating at times. Coaching and as a fighter, I always compared the excitement similar to a roller coaster. The build up where the roller coaster is like. Boye time, baby. Boye time. And you're like, oh, I don't know if this is a good idea. But once the roller coaster is going, it's really fun. We give our hugs, they do the Vaseline, and the fighter goes in the cage. 
You give them the last few seconds of advice. Try to get them focused as you can. Maybe one last sip of water. Tell the fighter that, hey man, do your thing and have fun out there. Some fighters don't listen to advice well. Some do everything you say. Some are like the extension of your hand in a video game. When Ioana was fighting Jessica Andrade, Andrade has these really good, powerful takedowns. She'll get to the leg and she'll like lock high in the crotch and she slams everybody. Every time Andrade got in close, she lifted her up, but we worked on making sure we always leaned forward. And so even if she got taken down, she would just lay down her hand and bounce back up. Head, 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 head. Lean, lean forward, lean forward. Yes, nice job, nice job. Lay foot to the floor, foot to the floor. Easy, nice. nice. It worked 100% of the time, precisely how we thought they would. Beautiful. Hey, back to it, back to it. Game planning depends quite a bit on your fighter and the style of the fighter you're fighting. Sometimes there should be a strict game plan because maybe the fighter is really dangerous in one area. One fight where the plan came together was Jorge Masvidal and Ben Askren. The flying knee was a beautiful idea. <laughs> he was drilling it 48 hours before and I took a few little clips of it and I thought it would work. I'm like, there's a real high percentage chance this is gonna work. And when it works, the place is gonna go crazy. Undefeated in the streets and making the walk for his 47th professional fight here tonight, Jorge Gamebred Masvidal. There was a lot of talk between the two fighters. And this was a guy who was an undefeated fighter, like 18, 19 and 0. Fight! UFC record, fastest knockout in UFC history. When a fighter wins a big fight or a challenging fight, it's emotional. I'm just as happy when my fighters win as when I was a competitor as well. It makes it all worth it. It's the most beautiful sport in the world. It's cool to be part of it at the highest level. And that wraps us up for another episode. Keep the conversation going online by using the hashtag UFC Connected. I'll see you next time.